It's February 25th, 1922, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Aria, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. Today I learned that France was still guillotining people until 1977. Just think about that for a moment. But anyway, it was on this day in 1922 when Henri Landru, the so-called Bluebeard murderer, became the fifth of 11 men in the 20th century to be beheaded by the French state. And just before the guillotine came down, Landru's lawyers asked him if he wanted to ease his conscience. And his reply, these were his final words. He said, that, sir, is my little suitcase, obviously implying that he was intending to take his secrets with him to his grave. He actually continued to protest his innocence in the face of an incredible amount of evidence, um, including, he was, I think it was actually in the courtroom, he doodled a quite detailed drawing of the oven where he had supposedly burned the bodies of all of his victims. So, you know, he wasn't putting on a particularly convincing front. I've got to say, though, the thing that I found most surprising about this whole story was that he was nicknamed Bluebeard after what turns out to not be a pirate. Yeah, it was based on a folk story by Charles Perrault, who popped up in our episode The Ancients Versus the Moderns. He's the author of a lot of folk stories like Little Red Riding Hood and Puss in Boots. And he wrote one called La Barbe Bleue, which is about a young woman who weds a nobleman and then discovers his um, cellar full of death. It's kind of like a variant on the poisoned apple idea. Women, come and live in our house, just don't poke around in our stuff. Yeah, and the reason that it applied particularly to Landru is that he had a scam on that led to a quite prolific serial killing career. He published a small ad in the classified columns of newspapers proposing marriage and pretending to be a rich widower, uh, and some 283 women replied. It was during the First World War. I think that made a huge amount of difference because Mm. Henri, when these killings started, he was in his 40s. He was married with four children. He'd been to prison a bunch of times. Um, He wasn't physically attractive. He was quite squat. He had like a a beard, which I guess contributed to his future nickname, Bluebeard. And I just think all of the younger men and the more attractive men were off fighting in World War I. And Landru was sweeping up. At the time of his arrest, he had either Mm -hmm. met or had romantic correspondence with almost 300 women. And as the scam unfolded, he then proposed that these... Uh, women should come to his place. He proposed to them, and then he lured his re- prospective new fiance to his uh, rented home in Gombe, which is west of Paris, and had them nominate him as the proxy to pocket their savings after their death. He actually had relationships with quite a few of these women, and then he killed them. And it's believed that he then put their bodies into his kitchen stove, and neighbours actually reported foul smells emanating from his place. And there was this other. Ch- particularly chilling detail that was revealed at the trial, which was that Landru always bought himself a return train ticket to Gombe, but only a one-way ticket for the women that he was bringing down. But it was typified even then, even by the prosecution, that his motive for doing this was to take their money. Mm. And looked at now, when you sort of just look into the psychology of the man, he was kind of deemed to be very nearly a psychopath earlier in his criminal career. And and actually, they kind of toned down the diagnosis so that he'd get a prison sentence. And then they kept returning to that, like, oh, no, he's not mad. He's he's just nearly mad. But looked at (laughs) now, like he obviously enjoyed killing women because that was fun for him. It wasn't just that he wanted to take their money. It seems like the, the money was a bonus. It was a bit of a family affair because he used his son, who was only 14, to help him clear the apartments that belonged to some of the women. He claimed he was a furniture dealer. And actually, when police found you know his little black book with all his victims in them, he was like, oh, no, they're just my furniture selling clients. And that's all there is to it. Just a coincidence that they're all dead <laughs> all in exactly banished. the yeah. same method. But, you know, lots of the, the, lots of the women that he seduced weren't wealthy. So it does lead, as you say, to the idea that he actually did get some kind of thrill out of killing what was the thing that gave him away though this is this would make an excellent mini series by the way because you've got the backdrop of world war one and it meant that police were really short staff and obviously very distracted there was a lot of movement around the country you know so everything was very difficult to keep track of a lot of furniture being delivered to dead women <laughs> yeah <laughs> right. well and although a lot of alarms had been raised the police had failed to pick up on any of them and it actually took a private investigation carried out by marie lacoste who was the half sister of celestine buisson who was one of his victims that was the thing that ended up opening the police inquiry she 
she gathered all of this evidence, including contacting the relatives of other victims and basically put together this missing persons case and presented it to the police, who then obviously took full credit for the whole thing. But he was actually arrested completely by chance because there was a warrant out for his arrest, but he was obviously very good at being on the run. He'd been on the run for years at this point. But a friend of this Marie Lacoste happened to spot him shopping on Paris's swanky Rue de Rivoli with his new mistress, and they just went and picked him up at his apartment the next day. Yeah, so his capture and conviction from that point owed quite a lot to the persistence of an inspector, Jules Bellin, who, uh, in the absence of very much hard evidence and a confession, gathered clues. You know, he, he went to his home and started to snoop around in his garden, though there are some criticisms of uh, the police investigation of the garden, which turned up lots of bits of women's bones, but they then failed to cordon off the area. Yeah, so anyone could have come and tossed in their women's bones. Sure. I mean, you'd expect <laughs> to find in the house of any decent furniture dealer a lot of different women's bones. There's nothing to see there. <laughs> well, but and then part of the problem was that the bones that they had, they couldn't even identify who they were or even what gender they were because they really had been turned into quite a, a, a fine powder. His one male victim uh, was the teenage son of one of his female victims who went looking mm. for his mother and then disappeared and no one seemed to notice that that had happened either. Um, And he could have carried on doing this for years without building up proof. They found fragments of bone, a tooth and a partly burnt hairpin. That's what the prosecutors had to build a case against him. And repeatedly in court, he kept saying, your proofs, monsieurs, where are your proofs? And so, as you can imagine, this case caused a massive media response and the resulting trial was a huge sensation. Train loads of spectators were pouring into the courtroom, including, weirdly, Richard Kipling, who ha- just happened to be there, uh, and Maurice Chevalier, a young Maurice Chevalier, turned up there too. <laughs> it did have this O.J. Simpson-like air about mm. it. Um, both the crime itself was sensational, but also I think people started to get the sense that he was going to get away with it. And by the end of the trial, there were 500 spectators crammed into the court, which was double the courtroom's capacity. Well, we should say the reason they thought he was going to get away with it was because he did have an absolutely cracking defence attorney. So he was represented yes. by Vincent de Moreau Gieferi, who was considered one of the best in France, was said, by the way, to hate Landru on a personal basis. Uh, but then again, I guess you wouldn't want it recorded for posterity. But he got on really, really well with this serial killer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but believed passionately against the death penalty. And he did a good job at pointing out that there really were holes in the case and kind of deriding a lot of the women who testified against Landru, which is another really unsavoury thing. I mean, here you have this man who clearly hated women, butchered women, killed women in the worst possible way. And then when women were brave enough to come out and say what he'd done in court, the defence attorney, I mean, I know it's his job, but he basically turned the court against them as gossipy people, you know, Mm. seamstresses, what do they know? I mean, you look at a photo of the jury, they're all men. They've all got the same moustache. They've all got the same moustache that Landry has. They all look the same. There's an amazing photo of them stuffing their paper verdicts into an urn for some reason. That's how they decided on it. Yeah, and despite the fact that the evidence was far from clear, it actually only took three hours for the jury to Mm. deliberate. And then they returned a verdict of guilty on all 11 murders by a majority of nine to three. But the weird thing was is that straight away, Morrow, the the, the defence attorney, instantly approached the jurors and asked them to sign this pre-drafted clemency appeal that Landrieu had supposedly written, but he obviously didn't write it. And if Landrieu himself had agreed, then his sentence would have been commuted to hard labour in prison. But he refused to sign it, maintaining that he was entirely innocent. So he basically signed his own death warrant. And it really was this sort of enduring fascination that emerged out of this whole case and horrifying as his crimes obviously were. He inspired this bizarre, devoted following in France and even while he was awaiting trial, several thousand people voted for him as an undeclared candidate in an election Uh, and while he was behind bars he received uh, 4,000 letters from admirers including 800 proposals of marriage which makes me think that during World War I there really must have been a great dearth of mankind uh, to choose from if uh, if this guy was one of your better (laughs) options. Well, I mean, this is a real phenomenon, though, isn't it? You know, women being attracted to these psychopathic men, like all the serial killers and the school shooters and everything. They have these strange online followings. Well, his house at the time was turned into a themed restaurant. Bear in mind, he cooked his victims. (laughs) You could go to his house and eat in, you know, 
<laughs> the canteen blue beard or whatever. <laughs> well, speaking of bad taste, Lanjou's severed head eventually found its way to a museum in Hollywood uh, called the Museum of Death. They at least specify that you're not allowed to take a selfie with his severed head. You can't take a camera in there. So <laughs> right. It's a great deal of respect for the dead there, so I wouldn't, <laughs> wouldn't underplay that. Next time... At a celebrated collection of photographs of rural American mailboxes entitled Flags Up. <laughs> Love the show? Support the show. Patreon.com slash retrospectors. Part of the ACAST Creator Network.